tragedy at Philadelphia baseball grounds. It was the worst disaster in professional sports history. A dozen people were dead and hundreds more were injured. Police reported that bodies were piling up along 15th Street and Huntington Avenue. Many were covered in blood and mud. Some had their clothes ripped off from the force of the fall. Police commandeered wagons and carts in order to transport the injured to local hospitals. But soon the injured overran the hospitals and local residents opened up their homes to help those who were hurt. They called it Bloody Saturday, August 8th, 1903. Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball History. On this channel, we talk about the history of baseball from the A's to the Phillies to the 19th century. And sometimes we talk about contemporary baseball issues. So if you love baseball and if you love Philadelphia, stick around and subscribe to our channel. How do you show your home team pride? With mugs, t-shirts, masks, phone cases, tote bags, and so much more. Check out tpublic.com and search for Philadelphia baseball history. The day started off like any other late summer day in Philadelphia at the turn of the century. The Boston Bean Eaters were in town to play a doubleheader against the Philadelphia Phillies. The fans were certainly not in for a stellar baseball game, as both teams were firmly entrenched in the second division. After playing to a tie after nine innings in the first game, the Phillies gave up two runs in the top of the 12th and can only get back one in the bottom of the inning. Boston had edged out the Phillies 5-4. The second game saw an equally tight contest. By the time the teams reached the fourth inning, they were tied at five apiece. The Bean Eaters' Joe Stanley came to the plate with two out, but there was some commotion in the left field bleachers. There was a loud crash. Fans were screaming, and some had come running out to the field, fearful that the bleachers would collapse. A wooden balcony that served as a walkway between the grandstand and the bleachers had collapsed, sending hundreds of fans falling to the streets below. When the extent of the disaster was known, the second game was halted and postponed as police responded to the incident and tried to help the injured. In 1903, the Phillies played their home games at Huntington Street Grounds. It was also known as the Philadelphia Baseball Grounds, Philadelphia Park, or National League Park. It was a stadium nestled between Broad Street and 15th Street along Lehigh Avenue and Huntington Avenue. The park would later be known colloquially as the Baker Ball, after William Baker, the Phillies president from 1913 through 1930. The park initially opened with a wooden grandstand and wooden bleachers in 1887. However, during a road trip in 1894, the bleachers and the grandstand had caught fire. The fire destroyed the stadium, necessitating that it be rebuilt. The park reopened in 1895. It became the first baseball stadium that used steel and brick in its construction. Indeed, with the use of mostly fireproof materials, the park was hailed as a marvel of modern baseball architecture. But that accolade wouldn't stand because the Phillies ownership skimped on the maintenance and upkeep of the stadium. And it was during the fourth inning of the second game when all the commotion started. It was a little before quarter to six. Just outside the stadium, two men, who were obviously drunk, were stumbling down 15th Street. They were followed by a group of children who were teasing them. One of the drunks grew annoyed at being teased. So he turned and he moved towards the children. He grabbed out and reached the hair of a 13-year-old girl, Maggie Terry. But then the drunk lost his balance and he fell on top of her. Maggie screamed in terror, as did her friends. Soon they were yelling, help! and murder in order to get the attention of anyone who could come and help them. And at the stadium, just above the street at 15th and Huntington, there stood a wooden balcony. Upon hearing the commotion, fans crowded onto the balcony to see what was going on in the streets below. But too many people had pushed their way onto the balcony. The Philadelphia Inquirer estimated that over 300 people had crowded onto that small balcony, not built to support all that weight, 
the balcony began to teeter and pull away from the wall that supported it. Feeling the balcony about to fall, many fans grabbed onto the people who were behind them in order to try to steady themselves. But instead, they pulled more people onto the balcony, and the balcony fell onto the street and pavement below. Behind the people on the balcony, there were still more fans who were pushing their way to see what was going on. They too began to fall onto the street below them. The Inquirer wrote, within the twinkle of an eye, the street was piled four deep with bleeding, injured, shrieking humanity, struggling among the piling debris. One police officer who rushed to the scene reported, there must have been a hundred men and boys and every one of them was covered with blood. Some of them had their clothing almost torn from their bodies, while others were so bespattered with blood and mud as to be almost unrecognizable. Under the debris were forms of those who were unconscious. You could not tell whether they were dead or alive. Timber, rubbish, and bricks were piled everywhere. Police wagons and ambulances responded to the scene, but there were too many injured people. Soon, passengers were taken off streetcars so that they could be used to transport the injured. The police also commandeered wagons and those newfangled automobiles in order to get people to the hospitals. Even the hospitals, Samaritan, St. Luke's, and the Jewish Hospital, now called Einstein Medical Center, were overrun. People in the surrounding neighborhoods opened their doors to the injured, and doctors rushed to the site. But some unscrupulous people took advantage of all the commotion, and they began to pickpocket the crowd. In the end, 12 people had died, and 232 were injured. It was the deadliest disaster in baseball history. The second game was stopped as fans jumped on the field from the left field bleachers. Players grabbed bats to defend themselves as they rushed to the clubhouses, which were located in the outfield. This was before stadiums were built with direct tunnels to the clubhouses, so players, they had to run across the field in order to get to the clubhouses for their safety. In the end, the Philly season was delayed by 12 days as the city dealt with the aftermath and the investigation of the tragic event. When the Phillies resumed play, they played their home game at Columbia Park, the home field of their crosstown rivals, the Philadelphia A's of the American League. Lawsuits, of course, ensued. The original Phillies owners, Colonel John Rogers and sporting goods magnate Al Reach, had sold the team in 1902. However, they retained ownership of the stadium. Both would be involved in the lawsuits. And this was not the last disaster that would happen at the Baker Bowl. Indeed, the split between the ownership of the team and the ownership of the ballpark would continue. Eventually, Philly's owners would be locked into a 99-year lease for the use of the ballpark, which continued to deteriorate. Looking for a new stadium for the team, at first, Philly's president, William Baker, and athletics business manager, Ben Scheib, would squabble over concession sales when negotiating the use of the A's new home field, Scheib Park, for Philly's games. This caused the Phillies to continue to use the rundown facilities until 1938, when they finally closed the Baker Bowl and moved to Shy Park. The long use of the dilapidated park almost certainly damaged the Phillies' finances until they were on the brink of bankruptcy in the early 1940s. But now it's your turn. Tell us about your favorite Philadelphia baseball venue in the comments below. Give us a like, tell your friends about us, and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. If you have any ideas for topics that we can cover in the future, please let us know in the comments below. If you would like to see more of these videos, please consider becoming a patron through Patreon. Again, we'll have a link in the description box below.